there is a way in which truth comes. Okay? And when you read uh, 2 Samuel chapter 1, as David is returning from, you know, the fight he had with the Amalekites, he wanted to know how the warfare had gone between the Israelites and the Philistines. And so, this young Amalekite comes to him with a crown. And he gives David the news that King Saul has died and I brought this crown to you. Now, naturally, David would have been excited to say, okay, this is a fulfillment of what uh, God had spoken. All right? Yeah. He would have been excited to say, this is a fulfillment of what God had spoken. But remember... In Deuteronomy, in Exodus, God had given a command that brought out Amalekites from remembrance. So David is not just paying attention to the fulfillment of the prophecy or looking at the crown, but is looking at who has brought this crown. Okay? Of course, what you read on the surface is David tells this young person, did you not have fear to lay your hand on the anointed one? But more importantly, I want you to remember that this man is an Amalekite. Okay, so that is where we end it. Now, let us read John chapter 18, verse If you have a Bible, you can get a Bible and read along with us. John 18, verse 37. Okay, so this is the time when the Lord Jesus was made to stand before Pilate. And there is an accusation on the Lord that he was claiming to be the king of the Jews. Now let us read verse 37. Pilate therefore said unto him, Ed thou a king? Ed thou a king then? Jesus answered, thou, is, thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth Heareth my voice. I want us to speak those words together. Brother Zima, is the video still okay? It's okay. The video is okay. Even the sound? Uh, okay, those who are watching us, please help us to know if the sound is okay, if you're able to get what I'm speaking. Yeah, okay. Okay, so I want us to speak those words. Everyone that is of the truth heareth Hear my voice. voice. Let us say it again. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Now, here are the question that Pilate asks in verse 38. Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? Okay, what is truth? Now, do you think if the Lord had responded to Pilate, if the Lord had responded to Pilate, trying to explain to Pilate what truth is, would Pilate have understood? Because what we read here, the Lord Jesus never bothered to explain to Pilate what is the truth. And why did the Lord not bother to start explaining what truth is? Simply because when Pilate is asking what is the truth or what is truth what Pilate is interested in listening is is it true or false that you proclaim yourself as the king as the messiah of the Jews Pilate is looking for a true or false kind of an answer 
But what the Lord Jesus is speaking is not a true or false matter. What the Lord Jesus is declaring is the truth. Now, I know the words I'm using can be pretty confusing because most of the times we've taken truth means something which is true, okay? In a very simplistic way, that is how you would explain it. But what I want to show you is something can be true, but yet not the truth. Praise the Lord. Amen. And that is why we are saying you need to watch the way of the truth. You need to watch the way of the truth. You know, like David, he's been given the crown. But you know, right in there was a very big temptation to have rejoiced and maybe get excited at the crown and forgetting who is holding this crown. By which way has this crown come to me? Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. So now, the Lord Jesus in speaking, if you watch the conversation closely, the two men are speaking different things. Pilate is asking, are you Jesus the king? And Pilate wants to know if it is true or false. But the words the Lord are speaking, they are beyond true statements. But the revelation of the counsel of God. And from this I need to say that you can know something to be true, but yet not grasp the truth of it. All right? You know, one time as a young Pentecostal evangelist, I used to love evangelizing. I used to move from house to house. I would carry the Bible in my hands and I would knock on a door and tell the people I have come to share the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I was a very young person then. And my evangelism went like this. I would ask a person. I don't know whether Brother Zima, we once did those evangelisms together. I would ask a person, uh, do you know that Jesus Christ died for your sins? The person would say, yes, I know. Do you accept him as your personal savior? Yes, I do. Well, to me, if all the answers you've given are yes, 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 and say, so, okay, you are saved, then you, 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 you accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your savior. So I'd say, okay, that person is in the truth. And maybe, well, you land into another person. Do you accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior? And the person would say, well, I would love to accept him as my Savior. Then, you know, I would say, well, repeat this prayer after me. Oh, Lord Jesus. And the person answers, oh, Lord Jesus, forgive my sins, forgive my sins. And at the end of it all, you shake the person's hand and say, well, the angels are happy in heaven. Welcome into the kingdom of God. And then, well, a person is now in the family of God. I don't know how many went through that. And, well, different denominations have different strategies. Other denominations have a set of beliefs. They walk around with their books and they'll ask you a series of certain questions. And depending on how you answer them, if you answer them correct or you say true, do you believe this, this and that? You say, yes, I believe. Then they say, okay, I think this person agrees with our belief system. And then that may, uh, uh, Brother Zima, help me with this, you know, and that may translate to uh, people believing that the person is in the faith. But it's not really like that. Believing in God or having salvation is not a matter of agreeing to certain statements of beliefs. To say, oh, do you believe this? You believe this? You believe this? And once I subscribe to a list of statements, in my mind I believe, okay, yes, this is true, this doctrine is true, then I become a part of your church and you say, well, I am saved. That is a man-made way of truth. But there's only one way of truth. And that has to be the way of God. 
Praise God. So salvation is not based on subscribing to a list of statements, beliefs, or doctrines that you affirm to be true or false. You know, that's just a mental exercise, or what you can call mental faith, if there's ever such a thing. And we may be interested to know that devils believe God. Did you know that? Do you know the devil believes that there's one God? Let us read, uh, uh, I want us to read uh, this this uh, verse uh, that should be in gems. Let us read uh, in gems. Okay, let us read James chapter 2 verse uh, verse 19. If you can read it along with me, James chapter 2 verse 19. Thou believest one God, thou doest well. Thou doest well. The devils also believe and, and tremble. tremble. Maybe you, you don't even tremble. But the devils actually even tremble. Amen. Amen. Thou believest that there is one God. Thou doest well, the devil also believes. Does that make the devil a believer? Well, here you can see that the devil also believes, but does it make the devil a believer? No. You know, one time... That should be Matthew 16, verse, seven, uh, Matthew 16, verse 15 to 17. You may want to read that. We're looking at the way of truth. Truth has a way, and it's only one way. There are not two ways about it. Matthew 16, verse 15. This is the Lord Jesus speaking to the disciples. He saith unto them, but whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon, but Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, Peter says, It's not flesh and blood which has revealed this to you, Peter. It's a revelation which God has given you. So now, Peter is commended for answering correctly, right? It's a revelation. Why? Peter says, you are the son of the living God. But do you know that there was another time when a person who was demon-possessed came to Jesus and the demons cried out, we know who you are. You are Jesus, the son of the living God. Did Jesus get excited to say, wow, you demons, you are acknowledging me and what you are speaking is the truth. I am the son of the living God. The demon said the same words that Peter said, but yet Jesus rebuked the demon. He told it to shut up and come out of the man. So when the demons said, thou art Jesus, the Christ, did the demons speak the truth? No. They spoke something true, but it was not the truth. Because truth is not just a mere statement of stating a fact which is true. The manifestation of truth is not just a statement that you speak with your lips. It is something to which your heart and your life bears witness. Your heart agrees with it, and because your heart agrees with it, it can be seen even in the life that you are living. Then we can say, you've, you have the truth of God in you. So, one person can say, I believe in Jesus Christ, is the son of the living God. They are speaking that out of an intellectual knowledge, because they 
They've read the Bible because they heard the preacher, but they've never had an experience of the power of truth right from within. And that is why you, you find a lot of hypocrites in churches today. A hypocrite can stand in a church service, they can sing hallelujah, they can sing a hymn, they can shake a hand, they can participate in prayer and fasting, but in the dark corners of the night, a person can be fornicating. A person can be living a very dirty life. But well, when it is in public where people are, one can put on what a Christian should look like. But a person can still have dirty habits in their life. So they know something which is true, but the truth, which is the revelation, the life, is not a part of them. Now, when God's word comes to us, God is not interested just in us knowing something in our heads, in our minds, by means of memory, where you say, well, I believe there was Jesus. He died for my sins. And yes, I believe the story is true. I am a sinner. He saved me from my sins. That doesn't make you a believer. It is, yeah, you are speaking words which are true, but the big question is, is the power of the truth of God a reality in your life? Because God is interested. God is in the business of changing hearts, not increasing knowledge in the heads and in the minds. Now, does that mean God doesn't give out knowledge? God gives out knowledge, but his knowledge is a life-transforming power. If one knows... Now, listen to this. Pastor Billy Joseph of Nigeria wrote something in his uh, book, Those Killing the Message. He says, what the devil is afraid of is not you filling your mind with letters. And he says, the devil will allow you to read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. He has no trouble with that because your mind can only be filled with letters, words. But what the devil is afraid of is a person who hears the word and the power of that word brings transformation in their hearts. Something, a power, a conviction shakes the foundation of their hearts. They live the old life and they start living a new life and they can testify, I am born again. And by their daily lives, other people can look at that life and their lives get shaken and they begin to desire to have that power which lives in you. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So that is what we must be interested in. We must be interested in receiving the truth. Not just true statements. Not just statements of faith or statements of uh, what you believe in. Oh, I believe this and that. And another person doesn't believe that and you feel, well, uh, that one doesn't uh, believe in this and that. It's not a theoretical game. Salvation is life. Now, let, let, let me illustrate this this way. Um, if I gave you a mango seed, eh? I love this mango seed illustration. So don't get tired listening to it. Again, I'm going to take my, my whiteboard. I don't know if my, my, my online audience will be able to catch this. Now, if I gave you a mango seed, all right, let's say this is a, that, that, that's a mango seed, okay? It is just a, it is just a seed. What color is a mango seed? It's a beige, green, brownish, green, beige, something like that. Oh, brown? I mean, I want it to be white. Okay, but you've all seen a mango seed. White. <laughs> okay, I mean a dry mango seed. What color does it look? It's beige, gray, something. Okay, beige, gray. I don't, I don't know about beige, I know about grey. <laughs> okay. Okay, but you know a mango, 
a mango seed and how it looks, right? Mm. Are you able to lift it in your hands? Yes. It's very light. I mean, it's something small, right? Yes. I don't know how much it would weigh if you were to weigh it on a scale, a mango seed. But it's very light, isn't it? Yes. Now, let's say someone who's never seen a mango tree came to our country. This person has never seen a mango, a mango tree, has never eaten a mango fruit. They have no idea about it. And then they enroll into a school. Let's call the school the school of learning about a mango. Okay? So the person enrolls into that school of learning about mangoes. And they've been assured that at the end of their course, they will know what a mango is. They're going to have an experience of what it, how a mango tastes like. And well, they get excited. They say, you know what? I would love to enroll into this uh, course. So they enroll into that course. And in that course, they teach them about a mango seed. In that course, they take this mango seed, they go into a laboratory, they slice it. They take it under a microscope. And in their notebooks, they begin to write notes about how, how it looks inside. What kind of chemicals are there. And as they study that, they even start developing some theories. So, oh, actually, I've discovered this. There is a certain chemical I've seen. And they write so many beautiful theories and notes about that mango seed. And at the end of the graduate, I mean, uh, uh, later on in their schooling, they, they show them pictures of a mango tree. So this is how it looks like when you plant it. It, looks, it produces green leaves, it has a trunk, it produces fruits, and they study that. They even tell them, can you draw it in your exercise books? And they put up very colorful artwork. Later on, they graduate, you give them a gown, and they graduate from the school of learning about mango. Now, if you were to call that graduate, and ask them about what is the cellular structure. Well, they will sure explain it to you with all the big terms and big words which they studied all those years in the school of learning about a mango. Now, let us get an old, poor, ignorant villager from the village. This man, his trade has been planting mango trees. Now, this person has experienced what it feels like taking a mango, burying it in the ground, seeing the life grow, seeing the beautiful green leaves protrude and up into the sky, receive the sunlight. And by that sunlight, the leaves begin to manufacture the food. And later on, fruits manifest. And this poor farmer eats the fruits and tastes of the sweetness of the fruit. Now, when you look at a, a tree, it's totally different from a seed, right? Is that so? Mm -hmm. Now, that's a mango tree. It came from a seed, right? Mm -hmm. Do they measure the same in terms of kilograms weight? No. Which one is heavier? A mango tree, right? You know, God is amazing. God is amazing. When you look at a seed, it's a very light thing. But do you know that in its DNA, in the DNA of the seed, is information about a tree. There can never be anything on the tree which was not in the DNA of the seed. Mm. All you are seeing in a big tree, it's a huge substance. You can't carry it in your hands. All the weight which you see here, the weight which is here, I don't know how many kilograms, that weight was hidden in here. Isn't God great? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a marvelous thing to behold, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But now, the thing of it is, one person took a mango seed, sliced it, studied it, can even graduate knowing some theories about a seed. But that in no way comes anywhere close to seeing the actual tree, testing its fruit, 
When you taste the fruit, it actually becomes a part of you. Now, if you had two individuals, one has only seen a seed, they've studied it, and they can tell you all the nice theories, and another person actually have seen it with their eyes, they've experienced it, they've tested it. Who will give you a true witness and a true testimony of what a mango is all about? The one who experienced it. The one who experienced it. Mm. Is that right? In other words, the one who experienced it, they beheld, they experienced the power of the truth about a mango. Now let us read uh, what Peter tells us about this. <clears throat> Let us read from the letter of St. Peter. Let us see the way in which truth came to Peter and all the disciples. The way of truth did not come to them in the confines of a classroom and learning all the theories and all the stuff. No, sir. Now, let us read uh, Second Peter. Chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we are eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I am well. Pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mountain. We have also a more sure word of prophecy where unto ye do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Praise the Lord. Amen. So Peter is giving a testimony of the experience he had. In Christ. He says, what I'm telling you is not just a theory. We are telling you of things, you know, that is a part of our lives. We experienced it. In another place, Paul says, when I made known, uh, when I made known unto you the gospel, I didn't use enticing words. Now, we may want to read that again. These are wonderful scriptures and we just want to read them. And what we see in this is the gospel of Jesus Christ is not just in word, it's not just a theory, it is a living, life-transforming power. Now let us read 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Praise be to God. We, we shall start from verse 1. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of what? Of the truth. Praise God. Truth manifests itself. Mm -hmm. And once you receive it, it becomes a part of your life. Commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom also the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Now listen to this. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who commanded, now listen to this, for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness. Where is Paul taking this? From Genesis, right? Mm -hmm. In Genesis we are taught that in the beginning, the, God said, let there be light, and light shined in the darkness, right? Mm -hmm. So it was light. So now, you can read about light in a historical context of what God did in Genesis and say, oh, God said, let there be light. Now, that's a good story. Moses wrote it down and we are able to read it today. Yet, if that story does not fulfill its power in your heart, it's only a theory. You, you'll be able to quote, God said, let there be light and there was light. Now, if that is all you can do, quote it, it remains as history. It's a historical statement. 
it's a true statement but it hasn't yet manifested as truth to your heart until that same light shines in your heart all right so now he says in verse 6 for god who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath done what hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of god in the face of jesus christ and what paul is doing here he is taking what we read in history that in the beginning god said let there be light and paul says it's not a history that same light has done what has shined within our hearts praise the lord Praise the Lord. And you know, uh, in another place, Paul says, uh, the one I wanted to, 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 to read, he says, uh, when we came to you, we, we didn't come to you in the in enticing words. You know. Let's see where that is. Mm -hmm. uh, let us read uh, we can read Galatians chapter 1 1 Corinthians 2 4 that one is 1 Corinthians 2 verse 4 okay we can also read Galatians chapter 1 verse uh, 11 but I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. Right? And for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, there is nothing wrong with a person teaching you about Christ. But whatever you are being taught, if that power doesn't come to impact your heart, it, it's a theory. It has done nothing good to you. Now, where, where is that you mentioned it, brothers. Yes? 1 Corinthians 2, 4. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 4. Okay. Yes. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. Praise God. Amen. So now, that power of God can manifest in terms of miracles, healings, but that's not about it. That's not all about it. There may not even be a miracle manifest, but when the word is spoken to you in its power, it is going to do something to your heart. It will shake the foundations of your heart. It will shine in your heart and there will be that inner witness in you to know that God has done something in your life. And in your heart. Praise God. Amen? Amen. And you can say, I am born again. And Jesus will not be a historical figure that you read about in the pages of the Bible. He is someone you are going to walk with in a close relationship. And you know, if we are not careful many times, we can end up being a religious people, but who have no personal, intimate relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that is where, that is what divides a religious person from a spiritual person. A religious person goes to church on Sunday or on Saturday, whichever day you go. A religious person has a rule book, so I need to do this and that. But a spiritual person has a personal, intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. The person can be at his workplace or maybe it's lunchtime and a hunger begins to dig on his heart and he feels like I desire to speak to the Lord. And in a moment, maybe you close up your office door and you begin to speak to the Lord, appreciating him of his goodness or whatever the Spirit leads you to pray about. And there is a heart-to-heart -heart talk with God in such a way that you can say, 
He is my friend. Can you help me with him? He is my friend. You know, like the way Abraham, God said, Abraham is my friend. You know, and that is the relationship you ought to have with God. You shouldn't just have a religious kind of a life. There has to be a heart-to-heart -heart fellowship with Christ. You know, and when someone is hidden with Christ in God, a closer walk with God, the way Enoch walked with God, such are people who are candidates even for the rapture. You know, many times, especially as things are happening right now, there are many people whose hearts are unsettled. Oh, they write questions. Uh, Brother Peter, what can you say about the COVID-19? Uh, is it leading to the mark of the beast? <laughs> well, of course it is not, but so, even if it were to be true, even if 666 was to start today, you think it is mere knowledge that will save you by knowing, so 666 has started, I don't need to get the mark. You think that is what will save you? We can't be so carnal to think, well, uh, because of these things which are happening, I think I need to be right with God. You can never deceive God. He knows who are his. He knows those whose hearts are completely circumcised and yielded to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And that is why a true believer never panics on anything. If the Lord is coming tomorrow, I don't need to go to the mountain and, or be in prayer and fasting for me to be ready. Because my walk with Christ is every minute and every second and my heart fellowships with him every now and then. Sometimes you may not know that I'm actually praying. Maybe I'm seated here and I close my eyes and I'm communing with the Lord. You need to have a deeper, real relationship with God. Now, many times people struggle with so many problems of the flesh, lust, iniquity, all these terrible things, you know, sins and all that. And some people, they try to go on a therapy of trying to pray and fast, of trying to cast out this and that demon. The only deliverance which I know of, the real deliverance is not you trying to scream out, oh, bad thought, I cast you out of my head in Jesus' name, come out, evil thought. No, it never goes away like that. Immediately you stop speaking like that. It will just be an hour. The bad thought will land in you. We don't use the name of Jesus like a charm. You say, in Jesus' name, come out, then the devil is going to run away. That's not how it works. The name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, these are not charms we use to drive away evil things. I remember one time there used to be a person I knew, a drunkard, living a, a life which did not honor God. But this time, you know, the person had a spiritual attack. Some, uh, you know, he was having these nightmares. He wasn't dreaming, but this evil thing kept coming in his bedroom, trying to grip his neck or whatever was going on. And this person actually used to make fun of my spiritual life and when I'm praying, when, you know, when I'm closed up in my room to pray. But this time a terrible thing happened uh, to the person he ran away from the bedroom where he was, coming to sleep where we were sleeping with my brother. And when he was in his room, he says, oh, this bad thing came in my room. And I was saying in Jesus' name, but it's not going away, in Jesus' name. Now, I mean, look at this person. There's nothing about his life that testifies to the truth of God. But somehow, when an evil force came, maybe because he watches a lot of Nigerian movies, because, <laughs> you know, Nigeria has a way to dramatize these things. Uh, the other time, we were watching something, uh, a Nigerian movie with my wife, and uh, this person goes like, in Jesus' name, and this, uh, you know, <laughs> this person who had evil powers, when he hears the name Jesus, it's like something has struck his head and says, don't mention that name and when they say Jesus and then the person is staggering around and then people think the name of Jesus has that drama in it so that when you say Jesus and then the demons go away well if you really think demons are afraid of the name itself you need to answer one question for me the sons of Sceva you know the sons of Sceva in the book of Acts this young man saw Paul casting out demons in the name of Jesus 
And the Bible says they made their little deliverance ministry. They began to pray for people to deliver them from demons. And this demon answered. He says, what did he say? Jesus. I know. Who said Jesus? The demon, right? The demon was able to say, Jesus, I do what? I know. I know. And Paul, I do what? I know. I know. So if you thought demons are afraid of just hearing the pronunciation of Jesus, that demon shouldn't have spoken it with his own mouth to say, Jesus, I know. Demons are not afraid of the name itself. So that in the imaginations of your mind, you begin to think that if I say Jesus, it's like you've thrown a missile at some imaginary devil you are seeing in your head. <laughs> and then you think, well, the more I shout Jesus, the more power is going to come in the room. No, that is drama which is happening in your head. Listen to me. Here is what the devil is afraid of. The devil is afraid of a life which is surrendered to Christ. A life which is in fellowship with Christ. In so much that when you begin to pray or sing, the presence of God is with you. And the devil is afraid of that presence. So that when you say, in the name of Jesus, what you are actually saying is, Christ gave me the authority. I'm in a relationship with him. So even what you speak carries the power, it carries the weight, because you are truly a representative of Jesus Christ. And so you can say, in the name of Jesus, evil spirits leave this place, and the evil spirits will leave the place. Why? When you speak those words, you are not alone. But guess what? When that demon-possessed person, those demons, when those sons of Sceva said, come out, the demons looked at the young people and the demon could actually see that they were alone. They were not truly speaking in the authority of Jesus Christ. That is why the demon said, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you? Can you identify yourselves? In other words, the presence of God, you, you are trying to testify of a truth which is not really with you. Mm -hmm. Praise God. Amen. Amen. So, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. The truth shall set you free. So now, how do you know the truth? It is not knowing it like you go in a classroom and you begin to read some story about Jesus. Knowing the truth, the knowledge of truth is not something which is just at the level of your mental faculties. When God discloses the revelation of truth or a mystery or the preaching of his word, whenever God declares his word, you can only say you've received the knowledge of it when you've intimately related with it. It touches your soul and fills your heart. You know, in the Old Testament, when a man and a woman came together, they say, and a man knew his wife, and life came out of that, right? Mm -hmm. And when you read Matthew 7, 21, Matthew 7, 21, the Lord Jesus says, In that day many will say to me, We casted out demons, we did many wonderful works, we did this and that. But I'll tell them, get away from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. I never knew you. The big question we need to ask ourselves, each one of us, is does the Lord Jesus know me? Am I in a personal relationship with him? And listen to me. You can have all the knowledge. You can be so accurate in all the nitty gritties you want to bring out out of scripture. But if you don't have a life that manifests the power of the truth, you are nothing more than a theologian. I don't care how eloquent you can be. Because God never intended for his truth to be preached by mere letters, by mere intellectual discourse. God reveals his truth. God reveals his mind. God reveals his word. But remember, when his word Manifests, it always manifests with the life of it. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. And the word was God. in him was life. And the life was the light of men. So it is the life of the word that truly gives knowledge. The knowledge that gives you light to see where you're going. Praise be to God. Amen. Amen. So 
let us read 2 Timothy 3 verse 5. 2 Timothy 3 verse 5. Second Timothy three verse five. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Paul here is speaking of a people who have a form of godliness. When they sing, ho, oh, they put on a show of godliness. When they speak, they seem to have godliness, holiness, righteousness. But yet, there's something which is lacking in their lives. And that is the power of God. So here he says, having a form of godliness. So form is just an appearance. It is just something that looks like. But when you come closer to look at that person's life, you realize that they haven't experienced the power that transforms, the power that can bring out a true witness and a testimony out of your life. Now, in closing, let us read Acts chapter 1, verse 8. All right? Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. What I want to share with you, brothers and sisters, is you can only become a true witness of Jesus when that power of transformation has touched your heart. Even if you were to go to a Bible college, even if you were to read the Bible from cover to cover, as long as that touch of the Holy Spirit has never reached your heart, you are a false witness. Even if you were to bring out and explain in an accurate way, a doctrine. It can be a doctrine about baptism in Jesus' name. It can be whatever it is, you can explain it so eloquently. But as long as the life of the letters you are speaking have never reached your heart, you are not a true witness. Because a witness in the counsel of God is someone who has experienced the truth of God. And so when they open their mouths and tell you, Jesus is our Lord and Savior, they are speaking something they've partaken of. And let me quickly read this as I come to the thought I want to share with you uh, shortly. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. Now, most people, especially Charismatics and Pentecostals, they think this is the power for miracles and things like that. That's not true. Yes, miracles can come out of this power, but it's more than that. This is the power that transforms the life-changing power of God, the power that can make a prostitute live her past life and become a born-again child of God, the power that can make someone convert from being a gospel to a God-fearing person. Ye shall receive power after, the, after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Can you see that? So, our number one hunger in our lives should be having that abiding presence and truth of God in our hearts, in our lives. And only then can we be true witnesses. You know, <laughs> may I share with you what true, or let me say, more effective evangelism is. Like I told you when I, we were starting this sharing, you know, a long time ago when... Uh, would go out in the compounds, sharing the word, would move from door to door, house to house, trying to witness, trying to share the word. But do you know that we are living in a world where almost about everyone, they know about Jesus. Huh? They know that uh, Jesus died on the cross, right? And almost everyone will say, well, I accept him my Lord and, as my Lord and my Savior. Now, do you really think everyone is a Christian? Do you really think everyone, they've truly experienced the born-again experience just by merely knowing and accepting that Jesus died for them? It, it can never be. It can never be. Here is true evangelism. True evangelism is not just getting your Bible. You go out and 
trying to go on a tour to preach on the streets. There is a more effective evangelism than that. True evangelism is actual workplace. What kind of a life do people see? If you have the Holy Spirit abiding in you, there will be a power that resides in your life. And a sinner person will be attracted by that light. You've seen how insects get attracted by light sometimes in the night? Mm -hmm. A sinner person will know that there is something which is missing in their life but which is in your life. Even when they don't agree with you on certain things, they will be able to see that power abiding in you because the gospel is about that power, not some theoretical stuff you can churn out of your mouth. It's about the life-transforming power that flows out of your life. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a little testimony that happened. Um, well, I'm a teacher, and I'm, I'm trying to come up with a very careful way to bring out this so that, you know, um, I bring it out in a very general way. This time I entered this lecture room, and of course I was teaching about computers and IT and, you know, Normally, that is my approach. I enter a classroom, then I, I need to go into stuff I need to teach that day. But on this particular day, I don't know what came into my mind. <laughs> Instead of talking about what I am supposed to teach computers and stuff, I started the lesson by saying, you know, young ladies, it's a terrible thing to do abortion. It's a wicked thing. It's a terrible thing. And then I, I, I said, you know, a long time ago they used to call it child sacrifices in those pagan religions. But a modern term today which has been beautified and sweetened up is abortion. But it is just as wicked as how those ancient tribes would take little babies and throw them into the fire. Then I said, it's a wicked thing. And well, later on I thought, why am I speaking this? I'm supposed to be teaching computer science here. I said, okay, we can go into the lesson. Well, it was many months after that, about three, four months, a knock came on my door, the door of my office. I opened and it was a young lady, you know, and she says, oh, sir, I would like to speak to you. I said, oh, sure. So I thought it was one of those things, maybe they're asking for assignments or certain scripts which I had marked and, you know. So she said uh, she, she, she needed to speak to me and I said, well, you can go ahead. And she says, well, uh, I don't know about this, but I feel you are the right person I need to speak to about this because um, I feel God used you. So I was still baffled. I mean, when I'm in my classrooms, I'm not a religious person. I just teach uh, these things. And she said, do you remember one time you came in a class and you talked about abortion? She said, when you mentioned that, my heart jumped. I got afraid. I got scared. Because I'm a student. My father sponsored me. But then I didn't do things right. I was impregnated. In that day you were speaking, I had arranged everything for an abortion to be done. But then... You just came in the classroom and from nowhere you said abortion is wicked.
She says, I, I got so scared. I thought you were speaking to me and I was wondering, did someone tell you anything? But again, no one knew. I was the only one who knew about my pregnancy. So she says, from that time, I had decided to keep the child because of those words. But now please advise me, how do I break this news to my parents and all that? Now, you know, when I look back at that testimony, I see how God can use us when our minds and our hearts are in tune with him. God is going to use us like a glove. We won't even be aware of what is going on, but actually God is using us to do something. And you know what? Later on, I was sent pictures of that baby, and I was so happy. When I look at that beautiful, nice-looking baby, I have a testimony in my heart that that day the Lord used me to speak by word of knowledge to save that life. <laughs> Now, imagine how many more things God can use us in if we walk so closely with him to such an extent that God can arrest our minds at a certain point and we are going to become his microphone through which he can speak to reach out to a certain person, you know. And I believe that young lady, in all her life, she will live, she will live to remember what God did in her life that particular day. So saints, I believe that morning I was a witness of Jesus Christ. How was I a witness? No, I didn't tell the person, do you know that Jesus died for you on the cross of Calvary? That person saw the power of God, the truth of God manifest itself. And she was interested to listen to my advice because she believed God had spoken through me. Now, of course, that doesn't mean God has to use you in some miraculous way. God has to use you in seeing visions and all that. You may not have that gift, but if um, we walk closely with God, we spend so much time in prayer, and our hearts get so filled with the love of God, you won't need to open your mouth to speak about Jesus to your neighbor. They'll see something different in you, in the way you talk, in the way you do your work. You can win someone to Christ even without opening your mouth in any way, but because the life of God is declaring itself in you. And you know what? God is looking for such people. The world is full of so many Christians who are warming up benches in church, but very few he can count in his hands who are truly having the truth of God manifesting through their lives and bringing people to Christ. Christianity has managed to win converts, to increase numbers in churches. But the big question should be, how many people have truly converted, have truly experienced the way of the truth of the gospel. Do you know why Peter was willing to be crucified? To feel those terrible Roman nails pierced through his hands. You think he had just accepted the gospel of Jesus as a theory? No. What made Paul be willing to get beheaded for the testimony of Jesus? One thing you can see in all these martyrs there is something which happened deep down in their hearts that was more than theory. Something which shook the very foundation of their hearts that they were willing to die for that. That can only happen if you've experienced the way of the truth. Amen. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen? Amen. So it is my prayer, brothers and sisters, myself included, that we check ourselves in our hearts, in our daily walk, and be surrendered and yielded to God that he can cleanse our hearts so that our hearts is free of anything that stands between us and God. When his light shines through us, our lives need to be like a glass so that his light penetrates through us and there is no dirty or dross that would hinder that light. May that be your life. May that be my life. And in that way, we are going to be true witnesses of the Lord 
Jesus Christ. Okay? So always remember, witnessing about Jesus is not just a theory of trying to, to, to negotiate or to market a list of your doctrines. Someone can believe what you believe, but that doesn't mean they are born again. Mm -hmm. So we need to pray, we need to walk with God so that that life transforming power of the truth of God becomes a reality in our lives. May the Lord richly bless all of us. Amen. Amen. Okay, we shall stand here and just give thanks to the Lord and pray the way the Spirit of God has ministered to you. If you feel the, the Lord has ministered to your heart, you can go in your room, you close your door and just spend a few minutes talking with the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, just talk with the Lord and, and pray and see how the Lord has ministered to you. All right. Amen. Okay, just go ahead and speak to the Lord. Amen.